Well, I guess I get started. Um, okay. Uh, if, yeah, if you if you want to go, I mean, uh, I think probably if you wait one more, a couple more minutes, a few more will show up. But uh, but it's up to you. Whatever you want to okay. go. Okay. Well, I just don't want to take too much of your time. Oh, it's okay. I mean, it's uh, you know, um, yeah. But yeah, go ahead. Go, you can go ahead and go when uh, whenever you're ready. All right. Um, well, I'll just uh, introduce myself first. Um, so my name is uh, Edward Park. Um, people call me Eddie. I'm a junior. Um, I'm a junior like most of you guys. Uh, and uh, so I'm part of uh, Cal State Fullerton's uh, formula, uh, formula student uh, team. Um, and the reason I wanted to give you guys this presentation is um, because you guys are um, assuming that you guys are all, all juniors. Um, you guys are going to have to start thinking about a, a senior project, um, a design and uh, or senior project. So how senior project is, how the, this, how Fullerton senior project is broken up is um, a design semester uh, for the fall and then kind of like a manufacturing semester for the spring. Um, so Fullerton offers uh, the formula club uh, as a as a senior design for um, I think I think they cap it at like 20 uh, 20 members but uh, it's a cool way to uh, it's a cool way to do your senior design um, let me uh, there we go so formula is a, a legacy team so it just means that each year, uh, all the information gets passed down from um, senior to senior, uh, like senior year to senior year. Um, and the current senior year can decide what they want to do with it. Um, they can take it a different direction. Um, they can rebuild or just uh, build on top of whatever the previous team uh, decided to do. Um, excuse me. So, uh, so um, for the most part, uh, a lot of the a lot of the formula, uh, a lot of the formula team have been working with each other for a long time. So um, you will be working with people that you relatively know, um, and it's real life uh, engineering applications like everything that you guys learn from now, um, from the design process, uh, manufacturing. Which, um, if you guys didn't know, Cal State Fullerton does have their own machine shop. Uh, so whatever whatever the seniors design, uh, they have the capability to manufacture all their parts um, uh, th the way they want it. Um, and that's cool because we can uh, manufacture uh, and if it doesn't, if something doesn't fit well or if we need to make uh, readjustments, then we can actually um, manufacture it again. So, um, so we'll do uh, fail failure analysis. And then um, the biggest thing with the club is they'll do like presentations uh, f with their advisor. Um, and then with formula, we actually go into competitions. Uh, so there's three big competitions every uh, spring semester towards the end of the spring semester. Um, and then we get to take our car and uh, do a dynamic competition and then a static competition, which is more of just a presentation. Um, which just helps you in the real world because these are all things that you guys will be doing um, as you guys uh, graduate and go on to your careers, right? So, um, and it's a cool way to build your network um, just even for when you guys graduate um, or close to graduation. And even when you guys go to these formula events, uh, they have a lot of recruiters from um, big companies like SpaceX and NASA and um, they understand what we do here. They understand the importance of a club like this. So um, they have recruiters come out and then uh, people actually get job offers on the spot at these competitions. So um, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Um, so the three big things that we do is machining. Um, so like I said, we have a machine shop. Um, so you guys can learn to actually uh, do, the, do all the machining, learn how to machine. Uh, we use uh, mainly a CNC. We have a CNC water jet. Um, and then we have, there's a couple more that I can't remember. 
you guys uh, learn to, you guys can learn to weld, right? So along with machining, um, along with manufacturing, uh, a lot of the, well, I'll go into all the sub teams, but um, one sub team does a lot of uh, welding. Um, so you guys can learn to weld. Uh, I think this year they have a, a certified, like an actual certified welder on the team. So um, like his knowledge in welding is, um, it's, it's pretty up there. So uh, this year got very lucky. Um, and then the last thing we do is just composites. Just uh, bi the biggest thing the team deals with um, is carbon fiber. Uh, a lot of the carbon fiber gets donated from uh, companies like Boeing or SpaceX and NASA. The, this pretty much the leftover carbon fiber that they don't use. Um, so they just get donated to, to um, schools. Um, so there are f uh, five basic or there's five sub teams um, that comprise of the formula team. So this is a 2019 team. Uh, we didn't have a picture, current, like current picture. Um, so there's one, uh, there's one team for aerodynamics, right? So a lot of it has to do with like uh, fluids and um, just a, a more harder fluids. A lot of the structures. Uh, so the, the aero team just kind of, uh, so the aero team uh, usually works with like the, uh, the wing and then uh, these outer, just kind of like the outer uh, frame and um, what the car is, would kind of look like. So all the lip. Um, we have a powertrain team, which just works on the engine. They do the calibration. They do a lot of the machining. Um, so, uh, so we use a um, we use a bike motor. I can't. I think it was a CBR. If you guys are familiar with bikes, it's like a CBR motor. Um, so that's the only thing that that and uh, parts of the suspension and like the the wheels are the only things we buy. Everything else that you guys see on this car is actually manufactured by the students. Um, suspension works with vehicle dynamics and also machining, and then uh, chassis team, um, which you really can't see, but they're kind of like the they're the backbone of how the the car is structured. Um, so they work with a lot of the system integration and then uh, a lot of the welding. Um, yeah, so this is just contact information. If you guys like seem interested or if you guys have any questions, you guys can, I don't know, take a screenshot. Uh, I know some of you guys, I think, I feel, I feel like I have some of you guys in my classes. So um, I don't know if you guys see me around, if you guys want to take a message or if you want to take a screenshot, um, these are all the, uh, the leads and like the project manager, chief engineer, they're all the, these are all the emails. And my email is at the bottom if you guys just have any questions for me. Um, we communicate through Slack and Discord, and these are the, the two um, two links if you guys if you guys want to check us out. Uh, so, yeah. Um, uh, well, that wraps up my presentation. Thank you, Fresh Tran. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Eddie. Uh, before before we go, does does anyone have just any any quick questions about formula? Yeah, so uh, if you guys aren't involved in a, in a student project, I think this this is a really great opportunity because, you know, what what we're learning in this classroom right now is is really only just half the battle because it's you know if you if you ask you know any any engineering company out there you know they they don't want just someone who can do really well in the classes you know because the whole point of engineering is to apply it to a project like that so and you're not going to get an experience like that in the class in the classroom either so. You know, get involved if you if, if you haven't because it's 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 only going to benefit you guys in the long run and it's going to make the experience i think something that's really memorable too so um so yeah so thanks uh thanks eddie yeah thank you for uh thank you for your time thanks guys yeah have a good one all right you too all right um so let's go back to our regularly scheduled programming um let me go ahead and share my ipad again so good morning everybody um, we are on our last week of class, um, so we uh, this is week 16, and so just like I promised, you know, we're uh, we're not going to do anything, um, you know, that's going to be on the final. So you know, Wednesday we're going to spend all day reviewing. Today, I know there's a lot of questions on the homework, so I want to take some time to uh, to go over a little bit of problem two, a little bit of problem three, uh, just to just to kind of give you guys some hints, and then from there we're going to cover kind of a uh, um, like an extra topic called compressible flow. Uh, and so if you if you plan on pursuing uh, fluids um, a bit more here at Cal State Fullerton through your tech electives, 
Um, because I think this this and the lab, I think, are the only required fluids classes. But if you want to continue on with like aerodynamics, or repulsions, or combustion systems, uh, compressible flow kind of forms the baseline for that. So um, that's kind of why I save it towards the end, because it's it's not really part of a kind of a core fluids class. But a lot of our tech electives and a lot of the advanced fluids um, classes, they really build on uh, on compressible flow. So that's why I wanted to mention it. Okay, um, and so. Um, you know, our final is going to be next Wednesday. And so I, I'm still writing the final, but I, I, I did finish, um, I did decide on a list of topics. So I, I sent the study guides out to you guys. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to look at the study guide, I, I would definitely check that out. Uh, and then um, by the end of today, I'm going to put a poll on Canvas so that you can vote on the topics that you want to see the most in the, uh, in the review session. Okay. <clears throat> uh, okay. Um, and so for the, for the first part of this class, I, I want to go over problems 2B, a little bit of 2B, a little bit of 2C, um, and a little bit of, of problems 3B. Uh, so if you have questions on those problems, I think let's maybe let's hold those off until we, uh, we go over them. Uh, but besides that, are there any questions I can, um, I can answer before we get started? Okay. <clears throat> okay, so let's go over problem 2B on the homework seven, okay? Okay. And so, um, you know, this uh, this last homework that I've assigned to you, you know, a big part of it is uh, pipe flow problems. And so pipe flow problems, they, they, they're they very, they're pretty challenging. You know, not only in just, you know, it takes a lot of work just to get to a, a good point, uh, but if it's a problem like in 2B or in 2C, then you need to do a lot of guess and check too. And that, and that can be really time consuming. Okay, so for 2B, basically what we're saying is that we, we have the transport of water uh, from one reservoir to another. And so we can draw, I know the problem doesn't come with a figure, but we can draw a figure like this. Okay, so we can imagine a situation like this. In the middle, we have a pump. Okay. And then all along the, uh, all, along the, all along the pipe, we have a bunch of valves. Okay. And those valves are going to be important because they're going to add uh, minor losses. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm not going to write down all of the the um, the numbers for it, but in the problem, basically, I give you all the geometry. So I give you the length of the pipe, and I give you the diameter. Right. And so right away, since since you know all the all the geometrical features, you know that it's not going to be a type three. Okay. Uh, I give you the the power output of the pump, right? And so that's uh, 30 kilowatts. Okay. I also give you the surface roughness, um, and I give you all the minor losses. Okay. So I think in the problem, I basically said that the the only sources for minor losses are going to be from the valves. And so I have, there's going to be one globe valve um, and 10 gate valves, OK? OK. And so the, the wording for that one, I, I think, is really key because the uh, um, I, I got some questions over the weekend about, you know, should we should we consider, you know, that there's a sudden expansion here or sudden contraction here and a sudden expansion on the other side. Normally you would, but in this problem, I, I just told you that the only minor losses you need to consider are just from, are just from the, uh, just from the valves. Okay. And so uh, when the, when the, when kind of the, the wording of the problem is like that, um, then you can, um, you know, then you can just, uh, uh, you know, ignore all the other minor losses. Okay. Okay. And so the way that we're going to set this up is we need to start from our extended Bernoulli. Okay. Um, oh, first of all, um, before we even do that, uh, we we can uh, we need to determine what type of problem this is. So in this problem, the, it asks us to find the flow rate. Okay. 
And since the flow rate is an unknown, we know that this is going to be a type two problem. And so remember, if you have a type two or a type three problem, you know that there's, there's going to be some guess and check uh, that's involved with the, uh, with the problem, OK? OK. And so let's go ahead and set up our extended Bernoulli. And so if we call the, the outlet um, a location two and we call the inlet location one, then we have the following um, setup. And so we have uh, P2 over gamma plus U2 squared over 2G plus Z2 is equal to P1 over gamma plus U1 squared over 2G plus Z1, okay? And then plus HS minus HL, okay? Where HS is the shaft head, so that's gonna be the, uh, um, the amount of power that's given by the pump, uh, but we need to convert that to head form. And then HL is going to be our losses, OK? OK. And so the first thing we need to do is we need to simplify this. OK. And so in this particular problem, we can cross out basically everything here for the extended Bernoulli. So I think in the problem statement, I said you can assume the inlet and outlet pressures are the same. Um, we can assume that both, both the velocities are going to be the same because our pipe has a, a single diameter all throughout. And so we can cross out U2 and U1. Um, and also we can, we, uh, I think the problem also said that they're at the same height as well. So we can cross out Z2 and Z1. And so the only things that we have is, is, a, is we're gonna have a balance in between the shaft work and also the head losses, okay? And so we, we're gonna plug in uh, basically formulas for these two and then use that to solve for, um, for the flow rate. All right, any questions on, on this so far? Uh, Professor, I have a question. Sure, what's up? When do you use U compared to V? Uh, they, they, they both mean the same thing. So uh, I, think, I think I kind of just interchanged them, but they, uh, but they both mean velocity. So, uh, so you can use U or you can use V, um, you know, which, whichever you feel more comfortable with. Okay, thank you, Professor. Yep. All right, so the question in the chat is, I, um, I crossed out velocity because of constant Q. Is that valid? Yes, yeah. So that's, uh, that's, a, that's basically exactly why you would cross out the velocities, because if you have a constant flow rate um, and you have a constant diameter, so um, that's the other key thing. And usually for these pipe flow problems, you're, you're gonna have a constant diameter throughout, um, because once you change diameters, it, it starts to get a little bit more complicated, but that's, that's, that, that, that's basically the reason why you would cancel out the velocities. Right. Any other questions on the on the setup so far? Okay. Okay. So the first thing we're we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, compute the the uh, the shaft head. Okay. Okay. And so I think this is this is kind of the um, the um, the thing that I think tripped a lot of people up, because what I gave you in the problem with the thirty kilowatts. Um, oh, question in the chat. Would you divide power by rho g? Yes. Yeah, so we, we have to divide not only by rho g, but also by rho q g. Yeah, so that's that's the main thing that we have to do here. Because right? in the problem, what I gave you was w dot, which is power in watts. Uh, but remember, the units in this extended Bernoulli, everything has units of, um, of length, basically, right? And so in order to convert that power into a shaft head, we have to divide by m dot g. Remember, m dot is our mass flow rate where the mass flow rate, mass flow rate is nothing more than just the density times the flow rate Q, okay? And Q here is, the, is our unknown, okay? Uh, but I'm gonna do a couple more conversions just to make it a little bit more um, convenient for our problem so that we're only solving for one thing. And so what I did um, for there is I, I plugged in for Q. So Q is nothing more than just the velocity times the area, okay? And then for area, we can plug in uh, pi over four d squared. So HS, finally get an expression for HS is gonna be four W dot divided by rho U d squared pi G. Right. 
So this is the uh, this is kind of the the key step here is that if you if you uh, don't convert the power to this to this form right here, you know you're going to end up with uh, um, with not the right answer. Okay? And you plug in all the numbers for this, and what you get is the only unknown here is Q because we I mean uh, U since we we haven't solved for that yet, right? And so when you plug in all the numbers for this, you get twenty four point three five divided by U. So it's it's a um, yeah it's a it's a lot of plugging in, but the uh, but you should end up with something with the U on the bottom. Okay. Okay. So that's the shaft head. And so now let's go over the head losses. Okay. Are we to assume to always uh, work out the shaft head like this, where it's just uh, mass flow rate divided by gravity? Um, yes. Yeah. So if I give you the if I give you the the power in terms of uh, watts, which is what I gave in the problem, you need to divide by the mass flow rate times times gravity. Okay. But that only applies if it's in watts. Yes. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so from here we can uh, work out the uh, the head losses. So remember, our head losses is is always going to be the sum of the major losses and the minor losses, okay? And so our formula for the major losses is going to be F, which is our friction factor, times L over D, times U squared over 2G, plus um, our minor losses, which is sum of the loss coefficients, times U squared over G. The minor losses isn't divided by 2G? Uh, it is 2G, yes. I just missed that. Thank you. Okay. Um, and so what you, what you need to do from here is that uh, now that we have our shaft head, which is uh, this guy, and we have this expression for the head losses, okay, you can set these two guys equal to each other and use that to solve for U. Because we have everything else in the problem except for two quantities. Okay. Okay. And so our two unknowns here are going to be F, which is our friction factor, and U, which is our velocity. Okay. And so from this point, you have to start your guess and check. Okay. And so with guess and check um, methods, you know, I, I think the most difficult thing is 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 you know finding a starting point. Um, and so, you know, I think that's, that's, that's a fair question. Cause you know, um, cause you can, you can definitely do this problem and you guess F to be like seven and that would actually be very far off cause you know, F can't, you know, be seven. And so for these problems, you know, here's, here's kind of a hint on, on how to get, get you started, at least for type twos. And so type twos, you're, you actually have a, a little bit of a benefit cause you, you at least, um, have a little bit of a hint to where to start looking, right? right? Cause in type two problems, you can compute this guy very easily, right? So you take the, the ratio of the diameter divided by the surface roughness, okay? And I think for this case, it's 2.5 times 10 to the minus four, okay? Which is close enough to two times 10 to the minus four, okay? Right? And so since you have this ratio of D over epsilon, then that, that gives you at least a starting point on where to look on the Moody chart. Because on the Moody chart, you know, we have different curves for different values of D over epsilon. And so uh, for type two problems, what you can do is you can go to the curve that, that looks the, or that satisfies this D over epsilon, and then just follow that back and then kind of guess a, a reasonable friction factor within that, within that curve. Um, and so I think when I was doing this problem, I think my first guess for the friction factor was 0.02. Isn't that usually epsilon over D? Uh, yes, it is epsilon over D. Thank you. <laughs> I'm still asleep from the weekend. Yes. Understandable. <laughs> um, that's right, because D over epsilon would give you a much higher number. Um, okay. Uh, and so based on that curve, you know, the curve, those curves, you know, they, they, the, the Moody chart looks intimidating, but if you start from one curve, you should see that, you know, it, the friction factor doesn't change too, too much on that curve. So if, once, you, once you kind of uh, 
know which curve that you're following for a type two problem, you can guess something along that curve that's that's somewhat reasonable. And so the uh, I think the the reasonable value that I picked for this at first was 0 0.02. Um, and then I'll tell you right now that it was it was wrong. So it, it's the friction factor is not 0 0.02, uh, but that at least gives you some place to start looking, and you know you can start from there and start kind of reasonably guessing and checking. Okay, uh, any questions on, on that? Yeah, I think the main issue for me was actually computing the, the, head, law, um, the head form of the power mm -hmm. and converting that into the order of that just didn't go. Did we cover that in some of our pipe flow or our flow over external stuff? Notes? I think, I, I think we, we might have mentioned it, I think, uh, I might have mentioned it really briefly before, but I, I think, um, when we were doing pipe flow, I, I don't think we did an example problem like that. Uh, not we with had the to pump. Convert. Yeah. Yeah. Not not with the pump or not with the turbine. So, um, so yeah, I think yeah, I, I I can see why that would be kind of a, a big um, kind of confusion point. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the the important thing is to know that you know Bernoulli can take a lot of different forms, and when you plug into it, you know everything has to be kind of the same units for for everything. Um, but but yeah, I, I don't I don't think that we did a, an explicit example with uh, with the shaft head like that. So yeah, that's a that's a good point. Yeah, that definitely helps though. Okay, question in the chat. I found a formula to compute F. Yeah, so actually, yeah, that's actually a good point. So there there actually are formulas out there um, to compute F, and a lot of them actually give you something that's pretty close. Um, and so uh, if you want to use that one for the final, you you uh, you can. Um, but the uh, uh, and for a lot of the problems that we're working with, usually you're in, you're in a good enough regime to use those formulas. Um, so the reason the reason I don't cover them in the class is because they they kind of depend. I think they they kind of depend on the Reynolds number a little bit. Um, the uh, um, on which formula that you that you have to use. So because there, there's different formulas for different regimes. Um, but if you if you if you want to use that for the final, just uh, that's um, that's fine. You can you can go ahead and use that. But the the kind of the traditional way is to use the Moody chart or to use a uh, a computer program to to compute it on the Moody chart for you. So I know that I know that I think Chris uh, uh, found a MATLAB script to do that. Um, there's websites that you can use to to compute friction factors too. So you basically just plug into that website. You know, there's there's lots of different tools out there. As long as you're kind of clear in your work on on how you uh, how you use that stuff, I'm I'm okay with anything. Okay, so that's 2B, right? And so 2C, 2C the setup is, is very similar, um, but 2C, you know, the, uh, um, the unknown there is the diameter. Okay. And so 2C, you know, I, I'm not gonna go over that one in as much detail, uh, but just know that it's a type three problem. Okay. Okay. And so type three problem, remember you're, you're solving for um, an aspect of the geometry. So in that case, in that case, it's the diameter. Uh, and I will say that, you know, 2C is probably, you know, the most difficult kind of problem that you can, um, that I can ask you to do from pipe flow because Diane, because, you know, everything depends on the diameter, you know, the Reynolds number depends on diameter, you know, your epsilon over D depends on diameter. So it's, it's really difficult to use, or it's really difficult to do type three problems just because, you know, you, you, it's really hard to get a reference for, you know, where to start guessing on that one. Um, and you end up with kind of a really complicated expression too. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll make this comment on, on, uh, on, on uh, 2C. And so, you know, the thing, the, the most difficult thing I think, you know, for, for type three problems is just knowing where to start guessing. Uh, because, you know, it, it's not like type two problems where you have a reference, but for type three, you know, you can guess kind of anything. Uh, and so if, if I do give you like a type three problem on the, on, on the final exam, I would, I would tell you where to start guessing just cause it's, it, it really helps kind of have a good starting point. But in reality, you know, if, if you're doing, you know, if you come across like a type three problem, like you're designing a piping system and you want to determine what the diameter of the pipe that you should use, a lot of times, you know, you, you're, uh, depending on the type of device that you're using, like you're designing for an airplane or you're designing for like a water fountain, you kind of already know kind of the size of your system, right? And so if you're do, if you're designing like a little dinky water fountain that's going to be, you know, in a uh, in a in, in like a 
in like a building, like a, a drinking water fountain, you're not going to use like a three, uh, three meter diameter pipe. You know, you're going to use pipes that will fit within your, your system. So a lot of times the, uh, the constraints of the problem or the constraints of the other devices, like the pumps and things like that, those will inform you at least on the, on the ballpark on where your pipe, your pipe sizes should be. But on like a textbook problem or like an exam problem, you know, you don't have that sense because it's, you know, it's, it's just text on a page, right? And so if, if I do give you the, a problem like that on the exam, I would tell you where to start guessing for that, just to kind of, you know, just to kind of start you off on the right place. So you're not, you know, just kind of guessing randomly. Okay. All right. And I'll say for, for 2C in particular, um, you know, um, the answer is very, really, really sensitive to the diameter. So I think, you know, the answer ended up being like, like what was it, 9.275 centimeters. And so if you even guess something like, like 10 centimeters, which is, you know, not that far off, you might get something that's like a negative friction factor. So, you know, and when you get something like that, that's a little bit panic inducing because, you know, friction factor shouldn't be negative. Um, but, you know, that's, that's only just because the, uh, um, you know, those solutions are really sensitive to the diameter. So if you're not really, really close to it, you could end up with something that's really nonsensical. So, you know, for those types of problems, it is, it is really important to start from like a, from like a good point. Okay. So that's uh, 2C or as, as much as I want to say about it. And now, now let's go over 3B. Okay. So 3B is a baseball problem. So basically, you know, uh, what I told you was that there's a pitcher that's going to be throwing a baseball um, and, he, and he wants to apply some spin on the ball in order to make it, you know, drop a certain amount. Okay. Okay. Um, and so I think the difficult thing for this problem is that there's a lot of, uh, of kinematics that are, that are associated with it. Okay. So let me kind of draw a diagram. So let me see. So we have the pitcher's mount here. Okay. We have a pitcher. He's very happy because uh, we'll say he plays with the Dodgers. Okay. And then on the other side here, we have his catcher, okay? And he's gonna be throwing the baseball, not at his head, but you know, but you know, that's as best as I can do drawing wise, okay? Okay, so the, the distance here is gonna be 60.5 feet, okay? right? And then we know that the ball is gonna leave his hand with the, with the horizontal velocity of 85 miles per hour, okay? Okay. Um, and we also know that the angular velocity for the ball is going to be 2000 rads per second. Okay. And so we're going to use that later to compute the, uh, the lift coefficients. Okay. Ah, oh, okay. Solve for the C loss, but I don't think I know what to do after that. Okay. Let's, let's, let's go over this. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's continue going over this and then we'll, um, we'll kind of see where you're, you're caught up. Okay. Uh, so the first thing to do here um, actually is to compute how long the ball is going to stay in the air. Right? Okay. Because we know that the ball is going to drop some vertical distance, right? Because of the because of the spin on the ball and the and the weight on the ball too, right? And so what we need to do. Um, is we want we need to compute you know how long the ball is going to stay in the air so that we can um, find out you know how much the vertical drops okay right and so to do that we're going to use basically these two pieces of information here so we're going to use the the speed and also the distance okay and so the first thing we need to do is we need to convert this 85 miles per hour into feet per second so that we can we can use that to to compute a time. Right, so we have 85 miles per hour, and so we need to compute the hours to minutes. So we have one hour, 60 minutes, okay? And then we'll convert that to seconds. So in one minute, we have 60 seconds, okay? And then uh, the miles, we need to compute the feet. And so we know that there's 5,280 feet in one mile, okay? And so from that, we can compute the velocity in feet per second. And so the time 
is going to be the distance L divided by the velocity. Okay. And so that will give you something should be around maybe half a second. Okay. Okay. And so now that we know, you know, what the, how much time the ball is going to be in the air, you know, what we need to do is we need to compute the net force on the, on the, on the ball. And so there's going to be two forces, two vertical forces that are acting on the ball. Okay. And so we have a vertical force. So this will be the lift, our lift force. Okay. And then we also have the ball's weight. Okay. And so the ball is going to fall just naturally just because the, of its weight. And then there's going to be a lift force that kind of pushes it upwards a little bit as well. Okay. And so the weight, you know, we can determine from everything in the problem. But the lift force, we need to find out, you know, what its lift coefficient is, is going to be. And from that, you need to refer to the, from the figure in the book. Okay. Okay. Uh, any questions on, on this? I noticed that the figure in the problem is referencing 9.39. But as I was looking it up in the book, I realized that it looks to be more like 9.41. Okay. I just wanted to confirm because I'm using the eighth edition, like you suggested in your syllabus, uh -huh. and uh, nine point three nine starts talking about the uh, lift and drag coefficient uh, as far as an angle of attack for a typical finite wing, okay, or, air, or airfoil. Okay, yeah, because uh, probably probably going to be nine point four one then, because I because the textbook yeah. I actually have here is actually kind of an older one. It's actually the same one I used when I was an undergrad. So for that one, it's 9.39, um, okay. but, but I'm guessing it's, it changed. I, actually, I do remember that. Yeah, someone made the same comment last year too. Uh, and I just yeah. forgot to, I forgot to update the problem. Um, but yeah, so it probably should be 9.41 because it's- uh, Lift and drag for a spinning smooth sphere. Exactly, like that? yes, okay. yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for this case, we, we don't need the drag coefficient. So the only thing you need is just the lift. Oh, okay. So the uh, so the question in the chat. So where did t is equal to l over v come from again? So that's that's just to solve for the amount of time that the ball is in the air. So so since we know that the ball is going to be leaving here with a vo horizontal velocity of eighty five miles per hour, you know, in the distance sixty point five feet, you know, I just want to find out how much time it's in the air. So I just take the length and just divide it by the velocity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so once you look up, or if you're going to use a, so um, I guess that's one revision, so it's going to be figure 9.41. Okay. Um, and so to use that, you need to compute this non-dimensional number here, um, omega times D divided by two times V. Okay. Right. And so uh, this is going to be um, 1.915. And so if you look that up in the figure, you know, what you should find is a drag, is a lift coefficient of about 0 0.38, okay? Okay. And so with that lift coefficient, you can find out the lift force, right? And then um, once you have the lift force, you can compute the, the net force. And so the net force on the ball is going to be just the lift force minus the weight. Okay. okay. And then once you have the net force, you can compute the, uh, the acceleration. Okay. And so acceleration is going to be net force divided by mass. Okay. And then here's where the time comes in. So you can compute the distance is equal to one half um, a t squared. Okay. All right. I'll question the chat. So remember in the lecture, you suggested other figures or tables besides 9.39. That means we can't use those numbers since we suggest a different textbook. So the, um, so all of those, you know, all of those figures that I suggested last time were for different kinds of geometries in different uh, situations. And so uh, um, how you choose which figure to use depends on kind of what geometry that you're using. Um, and what and what um, you know uh, what situation that you're you're going under. So the the key to using those figures is to pick you know which one 
you know, matches your, your situation the best. So in this case, you know, we have a, a smooth sphere that's kind of traveling through the air. You know, in, in that case, you know, like, like Stephen mentioned, we're, we're looking for the figure that corresponds to that, which is 9.41. Yeah. Oh. Oh, you got a different lift coefficient. Oh, the lift coefficient is 0 0.58. Okay, I, I need to double check that with the textbook then just to make sure. I might have been looking at the wrong curve for that one. Yeah. Was that variable two above two on the last equation? So that's omega. So that's the, that's the, um, that's the rotational velocity. Yeah. So that's the uh, um, 2,000 um, radians per second. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the uh, uh, so the lift so the which which coefficients that you use or which figures that you use you know it it depends on that. But if if I were to give you, you know, a problem like this on the exam, I would either give you the figure within the problem itself, or I would give you the um, the lift the lift and drag coefficients. But you know, in in, in practice, um, you know, which figure that you use, or or in probably in, in more realistic situations, which you know data uh, that you pull from you know, either from like a published paper or for some, or from, or for, or for some, from some tests that your company has run before, you know, depends on what kind of geometry that you're, that you're doing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any, uh, any final questions on, on this one? I, uh, I need to double check the, the lift coefficient. So I'll do that after the lecture, um, you know, um, just to make sure that it's, it's the right one. Uh, and then I'll, and then I'll, I'll, I'll send an email to kind of correct that. Yeah. Uh, but besides that, are there any questions on, on this? So that distance would uh, give us the height that we're looking for? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you took that, uh, you took the distance from uh, like just a simple kinematic equations, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So once you get the acceleration, then you can just use the, the kinematic equation for yeah, one half a t squared. Okay. Uh, so there's no more questions. Let's go ahead and uh, I guess for the last 30 minutes today, we'll uh, we'll go over compressible flow, or as much as I can cover. Okay. Okay. Uh, and so remember, you know, this stuff on compressible flow is is not going to be on the final exam. This is just to kind of um, you know um, uh, wet your appetite a little bit for if you want to keep pursuing fluids, you know, at at the next level. Okay. Okay. So the uh, um, so just kind of as an introduction, you know, compressible flow it, it's it's almost has a, a, a its own set of laws and its own set of theories that it, it follows. I mean, it's, it's all based on the same you know conservation of mass and conservation of, of momentum that we've uh, that we've used in so far. But because now you know the density is going to be changing, you know, it kind of has its own set of rules. Okay. Right. So when I say that the flow is compressible, what I mean is that the density is no longer constant. Okay. Um, and so once you once you start to introduce this new complication, you know, actually a lot of different things change because it's, you know, a lot of the methods that we used up to this point, it really relied on the fact that the density was constant. So that we can do things like, you know, we, we can say that the mass flow rate is constant or like the flow is, is constant. You know, um, a lot of those things really depended on the on that density being. There, okay? And so when it's not there anymore, you know, it's it's it complicates things quite a bit. And so just very briefly, let's talk about some applications for, you know, where you would most commonly, you know, have to encounter compressible flow. Okay. okay. All right. So the first uh, um, application is basically anytime you have um, flow that's at very high speeds. And we'll, we'll, I'll define in a bit, you know, what I mean by high speed flow, because, you know, that's, that, that, that name by itself doesn't really mean anything. But, 
you know, when I say high speed, what I mean is that the, the speed of the flow is approaching or, or on the same order of magnitude as the speed of sound. Okay? So once, once your flow speeds start getting that high, um, then you're going to start to have some compressibility effects. Right. So the second uh, common application is if you have any kind of uh, gas turbines. And so the flow of gas through a turbine often is at, you know, very, very high speeds. Um, and so, you know, um, and there's also, you know, big changes in temperature along, along gas turbine too. So that's going to have a big impact. Okay. Uh, and so prob but probably the most common application that, um, that you guys would see probably at least in, in another, in, you know, the next class would be aircrafts and space shuttles. And so aircrafts and space shuttles are, you know, they go very, very quickly, um, you know, especially, you know, um, especially with the really high performance ones. So if, if you're dealing with, you know, aircrafts or, you know, anything in aerospace, basically compressible flow is, is going to be really, really important to you. Okay. okay. And so let's, let's kind of go back to this moniker, which I gave here for high speed flows. Okay. And so by high speed flows basically means that, um, you know, the fluid velocity is approaching the speed of sound. Okay. And so the way that we, uh, we can report this is through uh, a non-dimensional number, actually. And the non-dimensional number is the Mach number. Okay. And so the uh, the symbol for Mach number is MA. That's typically what it's it's called. Okay. And its expression is simply just U over C. Okay. Where U right here, this is the fluid velocity. Okay. And then C right here, this is the speed of sound. Okay. And so if the fluid velocity is, is kind of approaching the speed of sound, this Mach number will be, you know, um, something that's, um, something that's, you know, of, uh, of, of some, um, it has a decent magnitude. Okay. And so generally, you know, the, the threshold here is about 0 0.3. So if you have Mach number greater than 0 0.3, then that's when you need to start worrying, worrying about compressibility effects, okay? And so, you know, for most of the flows that we've covered in this class, you know, our fluid velocities were not that high. And so, you know, even when we were considering air, you know, the, our fluid velocities were so low that the Mach number was maybe something like 0 0.0001 or something like that. And so even for, uh, you know, a gas, which is, you know, relatively compressible, if you're not flowing it at really high speeds, then you, you often you know, don't have to really worry about compressibility effects. And so it's only when you start to accelerate the flow, that's when um, you know, compressibility effects really start to take, it, take an impact, okay? All right, any questions on, on this? Okay. Okay. Um, so compressible flow as a field has, has a very, very rich history and, and very big theoretical background because, you know, um, it was studied, as you can imagine, it was studied really intensely through the development of like airplanes and, and space shuttles. And so it's going to be impossible to cover that, you know, in the time that we have left. Um, but, you know, if you, if you are interested in, in pursuing this further, you know, we have a lot of elective courses here at, uh, at Cal State Fullerton that will allow you to do that. Right? So I'm just going to list a few. Um, and so I think some of these are actually all going to be offered next semester. Okay. All right. So the first one, um, which comes to mind, is aerodynamics. So that's going to be EGME 433. Okay. Okay. And so that's that's a really good class. So you know, if if you are interested in going into aerospace, that's you know that's that's a really great class to take. 
Next, we have EGME 475. And so this is a uh, acoustics and noise control. And so, you know, sound actually, you know, that we'll talk about in a bit are, is nothing more than just pressure, pressure fluctuations that travel through the, um, through the air. Okay? And so if you're going to study acoustics, which is, you know, how you know, sound travels and how to design, you know, things like concert venues and, and rooms and stuff like that, um, then you need to have a good understanding of compressible flow. Okay? Right, so we have 418. So 418 is uh, space and rocket engineering. And so, you know, um, anything that has to do with uh, going into space um, or anything with rockets, you know, you, you have to know compressible flow. Right. So same thing with 434. So 434 has to do with combustion, uh, which is, you know, often used to, to propel um, aircrafts and space shuttles. And then 435, which I think is probably the follow-up to that, is uh, propulsion systems. Okay, and so that has to do mostly with uh, with aircraft and rocket propulsion. So you know, um, all of those systems they rely on kind of the 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 high speed flow of a gas to propel, you know, like an aircraft or like a rocket ship. So. Um, you know, those um, compressible flows can be really, really important for, for those things. Okay? And so if you're interested in pursuing this further or you're just interested in taking more fluids classes, you know, these, these are some good ones to take, you know, as, a, as tech electives, right? Okay. And so that's the kind of the introduction for compressible flow. Now let's talk about kind of a, a really important, um, you know, um, reason why compressible, why, you know, we have such a weird behavior in compressible flow, and that's the idea of wave propagation. Okay. And so, um, you know, this, this idea of wave propagation is, is, is a pretty new um, concept. So it, it doesn't really have much to do with, you know, anything that we covered before, but it, it will give you some context as to why the Mach number is important. Okay. All right. So the kind of the, um, you know, wave propagation sounds like a cool name, but it, it's, it's not that useful for actually describing what it actually does. So I, I kind of give it a, a different name. Um, you know, it, this is very informal, so it's, it's uh, not, I think, uh, you know, if someone, if you tried talking about this at Boeing, they might think you're crazy, but um, I like to call it the speed of information travel. Because whenever you have a, a flowing fluid, you know, the fluid itself will have its own velocity. So, you know, uh, that's, that's just simply the speed at which the fluid flows. But separate to that, there's also, you know, um, information that actually gets, com that gets uh, transferred within the fluid as well, right? And I'll, and I'll kind of, you know, um, you know I, I think this figure will kind of uh, help to kind of illustrate that. Right? And so let's say that we have an airfoil that's flowing through the air. And so as the airflow flows through the air, you know, the, the air is going to flow around it, right? So the air, the, air, the air patterns might look something like this. Okay. And so this, uh, this airflow is basically traveling this direction right here. Right? So the air is going from left to right. What's interesting here and what, what I kind of want to draw your attention to is actually this area right here, right in front of the, uh, the airfoil. And so as this airfoil is traveling through the, the air, you know, uh, upstream of the airfoil, you know, what you see is that the, the fluid is actually already kind of bending around the airfoil, right? And so basically before the airfoil gets there, the fluid upstream of it already kind of knows that it's coming and it kind of adjusts its, its direction.
Because intuitively what you would think is that, you know, the airflow is going through the air and the airflow actually has to collide with some air in order for it to adjust its, its course, right? Um, but that's not really the case. So in, in reality, what happens is that, you know, even before, um, you know, the airflow gets there, the air is already kind of adjusting to it and, and um, you know, and changing its direction, right? So if you took your hand and kind of swiped it through the air, right? Or it probably probably would probably be even more um, indicative or uh, probably more illustrative is if you took your hand, you know, through a swimming pool and swiped your hand through the swimming pool, right? The water that's in front of your hand already knows that your hand is coming, you know, before your hand actually gets there so that the water can actually, you know, split and adjust it, right? And so because, you know, the fluid kind of knows this already, there's, it kind of gives a sense of, you know, there's, there's something else that's going on in the fluid where information is traveling, you know, about the, uh, about, an unco in, about, about an incoming object before it actually gets there, okay? And this, uh, and this phenomenon where, you know, information about a solid object can travel in a fluid, that's known as wave propagation. Okay, uh, any questions on, on this? Okay. So let me kind of define those, uh, those two things. I think it's important to kind of keep these two ideas separate. So on the one hand, we have the flow speed. And on the other hand, we have the wave propagation or the, um, or the information travel speed. Right. And so the flow speed here is simply just the speed of the, of the fluid particles. Okay. Okay. Uh, and so anytime you have a fluid flow, if you put like a fluid particle in there, you know, it's, it's going to flow along with, with the, with the flow. Okay. And the velocity or the speed at which it goes, that's the, that's the flow speed, okay? Okay, and so wave propagation here, this is the speed at which um, information travels. Okay? And so um, generally uh, what I mean by that is this is basically the speed at which pressure waves propagate in the fluid. Okay. Okay. Um, because you know, as as a solid object moves through the flow, it's going to cause some disturbances in the uh, in the pressure, right? And so, if you have kind of your your hand and you kind of swipe it through the air, right? Around your hand, there's going to be some um, some disturbances in the pressure, and so that pressure wave is going to is going to you know travel through the fluid at a speed that's different than the than the flowing speed. Okay. So the um, kind of the, the analogy that I like to think about is uh, let's say that, you know, you have a bunch of people that are standing together in a line. Right? Okay. 
And so say that you know you're waiting in line at uh, at Disneyland or something like that for um, for Space Mountain or something, right? So you've been in line for like three hours. Everyone's upset. You know, everyone's hungry. Um, no one brought enough to drink. So you know, it's not a great experience. And so you know, there's there's two speeds at which you know we can uh, we can um, keep track of here, right? And so there's the speed at which everyone's kind of walking, right? So everyone's kind of walking forward at the same speed, you know, trying to get on onto the ride, right? But at the same time you know, information can also travel along this line too, right? So let's say that, you know, at the person at the front of the line, they tell them that, you know, the ride's uh, broken down for a bit and you have to wait, you know, 15 minutes for them to fix that. Right? Okay. And let's say that their PA system is, is broken too, so they can't announce this. So in order for that information that the ride is broken to travel to the end, back the, um, the guy at the end, you know, you can basically play a little bit of telephone, right? So this person can tell this person, right? And so the person in the front of the line can tell the second person, like, hey, you know, right's broken, you know, there's gonna be a 15 minute delay. And then this person can tell this person, which can tell that person, that person, that person, that person, you know, so on and so forth, right? right. And so the, the amount of time it takes for information to get from the front of the line to the back of the line, that depends on just how quickly people can kind of, you know, tell tell things to each other, right? But that's different than the than the speed at which people are actually walking forward, which I have in the red, okay? And so in fluids, it's the same thing. So fluids, you have kind of the, the flow speed, the flow speed here being the same as the red speed down there, right? right? And so the flow speed is basically just the physical speed at which, you know, fluid particles are moving forward. And then the wave propagation that's just in this that's just the speed at which you know information travels in the fluid right so that's kind of the the green phenomenon that we have in the bottom there okay right and so because you know we have these two speeds you know that's that creates some some in, some interesting um, effects in the fluid okay all right and so um, most of the time we, we kind of ignore this at least up to this point in the class because the wave speed or the wave propagation speed The wave propagation speed is often really, really high, right? Okay. Relative to the flow speed, it's 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 really high. So a lot of times, you know, information travels so fast that it's it's you know we can kind of almost assume that it's instantaneous. Okay. But, you know, even though it's really fast, it's not infinite. And there are some cases where, you know, there, there's going to be a difference in between, uh, or there's going to be a small difference in between the two. Okay. All right, so the question in the chat is, so this pushback is, is caused by these pressure waves. And so what does a pressure wave look like? Yeah, so that's, that's a really good question. So there's a, a, pressure, a pressure wave is really kind of hard to, uh, to, to visualize because it's, it's really just, you know, really just tiny fluctuations in the, in the pressure. Uh, but that pushback that that you do you know um, that you do experience that that is basically like a pressure wave. So like that's pressure information that's traveling through the fluid, you know, um, you know that uh, that you experience. Okay. Um, but you know, I think probably the best way to visualize a pressure wave to visualize a pressure wave is to kind of give another name for this wave propagation speed, right? And so we say that it's really really high, right? And the reason it's 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 high, or another name for for this, uh, which kind of gives um, motivation to the Mach number, is that this wave propagation speed is exactly the same as the speed of sound. Okay. Um, and so we we usually give that speed the uh, the name you know speed of sound because that's that's the way people usually experience it. Because what we perceive as sound is nothing more than just little pressure fluctuations traveling through the air, right? Um, so it's a bit different. You know, normally in the classroom I can basically say that you know my voice is you know carrying out as you know tiny pressure fluctuations in the in the in the, uh, in the air, and our ears kind of pick up on those little fluctuations. But here, you know, I'm I'm talking to my microphone and you're and you're hearing it, you know, into your computers. Um, but a pressure fluctuation is, is simply that. It's just, you know, little, you know, normally the air pressure is a certain amount, but as you talk into it, you know, that pressure fluctuates, you know, a little bit, you know. So it's, it's hard to really perceive unless you, unless you actually have a, uh, 
um, you know, a measuring device that can measure the air pressure. So if you talk into it, you should see that it, it, it vibrates quite a bit. Um, but it's, it's kind of the same thing for with, uh, you know, with the solid object moving through the air, that as the, as the object moves through, then it causes, you know, some disturbances in the pressure that travels through the fluid at this wave propagation speed. And so from a purely, phys from a purely fluid mechanical perspective, you know, the speed of sound is actually just the pressure propagation speed. Um, but most people are, are not going to get this, you know, deep into fluid. So we simply just say speed of sound because that's, um, you know, that's, that's the pressure wave that I think most people are, are familiar with. Yeah. All right. Uh, any questions on, on this? Okay. Um, so you can see now why the, the Mach number is such an important number for compressible flow, right? Because Mach number, remember, is nothing more than just a ratio of the fluid velocity divided by the speed of sound, okay? And so as the fluid is sped up according to the uh, close to the speed of sound, you know, then the fluid velocity will, will start to outstrip the, the speed of sound, okay? So when... And so when the fluid velocity approaches this wave propagation speed, um, compressible flow happens. And you know, um, just, just because we only have 10 more minutes, I'll say that a lot of weird stuff happens. Okay? And so I, I call it weird, not, not that, no, not that we can't explain it. So, you know, there's, uh, you know, people have, have dedicated their whole lives to explain these things, but it's, I call it weird because it's, it's very non-intuitive compared to, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of other things that we've covered in this class, right? Because for the last, you know, 15 weeks, we've been studying um, incompressible flows and, you know, we've, along the way, we've kind of built up a lot of intuition and a lot of conceptual understanding for, you know, how fluids should behave when they're incompressible, right? And so the thing is, you know, when fluids start to uh, display compress compressibility effects, a lot of these, a lot of this intuition kind of goes out the window. So you kind of need your a, a kind of a different set of intuition, and a different set of kind of uh, of, of rules to uh, to apply this to, right? And so they're all based on the same, you know, the same principles. It's just how it's applied, and just the fact that density can change it. It really changes up a lot of different things um, for the, uh, um, you know, for the um, for the analysis. Okay, um, so let's talk about kind of the, the speed of sound a little bit. Right? So let's actually put some numbers on this. Because okay? right? the speed of sound, um, maybe, may, uh, maybe you remember this from, uh, from a previous class or from Bill Nye, the science guy or something, but the speed of sound depends on the type of fluid that the pressure wave is propagating through. Okay. And so generally what you'll see is that as the, as the density of the fluid, the general density of the fluid goes up, then the speed of sound also goes up. And so just to kind of give you some, um, some numbers. And so let's look at the speed of sound in air. And so in air, the speed of sound is approximately 350 meters per second. Okay. And for water, the speed of sound is roughly 1500 meters per second. Okay. So you can see for water, which is a much more dense fluid, you know, um, we have a much higher speed of sound, okay? And so um, pressure waves will propagate a lot quicker in water than they do in, in, in air, okay? And you can see from these numbers that they're, they're really, really high, right? So three, even for air, 350 meters per second 
you know, is really, really fast. So that's, uh, you know, um, so you can, you can basically, you know, use that to quantify that. If you shout, you know, um, or say something, you know, uh, in one second, some, someone 350 meters away will hear that sound. Granted that you, you speak loud enough, right? And so that's, that's, how, uh, that's how quickly this goes, right? It's not as fast as light, you know, uh, sound goes a lot slower than light does, um, but, you know, it's still really, really, really fast, okay? Okay, and so uh, one more thing I, I want to go over kind of before we end today um, is to basically show you what happens when you approach that, okay? So what happens when, you know, the flow speed actually approaches this, uh, this propagation speed? And so in a, in kind of a short word, um, what this basically causes is something called a shock. Okay. So that might, that might've been a term you, you might've heard before, but a shock is, uh, is basically not defined as nothing more than just kind of a sharp change, you know, in fluid properties. And I'll draw a figure to kind of illustrate that on the next page. But, uh, before I get there, are there uh, any questions on, on this page? Here? Is that what a sonic boom is? It is. It is. Yep. A sonic boom is a is a manifestation of a, of basically like a shock. Okay. So let's kind of draw a figure. So so I, I will say that you know the the field of shocks and sonic booms is is really you know wide. So I, I took a class on compressible flows and I think we spent like three weeks on just shocks and 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 uh, and sonic booms. So it's it's, it's, it goes pretty deep and, you know, there's, there's a lot of really intense theory behind it, but I'll give you just kind of a, uh, um, just kind of a figure just to kind of illustrate that. Okay. And so just like before, let's draw our airfoil. Okay. And let's say that this airfoil is traveling through the air at a speed that's approximately, you know, the speed of sound. Okay. And so let's say that the Mach number is approximately one. Okay. Okay. All right. And so normally what, what we, what we saw before was that the streamlines kind of just kind of very slowly and smoothly kind of adjust to this, uh, um, to the airfoil, right? But when the, the airfoil is traveling so fast, you know, what's going to happen is that up until basically right at the last minute, you know, the, the airfoil, the, the air is not going to know that an airfoil is coming, right? Because normally the uh, the fluid has kind of ample time to prepare because the pressure waves, you know, they travel so quickly that, you know, the, the air upstream would be like, okay, you know, uh, a solid's coming. So, you know, let's kind of smoothly kind of, uh, um, you know, move out of the way, right? But at this point, because, because the airfoil is traveling so fast, you know, the air is not really going to have enough time to react, right? And so what's going to happen is that the airfoil is going to get here and then the fluid right next to it will basically be like, you know, oh shit, you know, there's a big big ass, you know, airfoil that's coming right towards us. And so, you know, they, uh, you know, they're, they're not going to, you know, collide with the airfoil. So what they're going to do is they're going to make a, basically a, a really sharp turn. Okay. 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 And so at this dotted line that I've drawn here, basically what's going to happen is that you're going to have a sharp change in fluid properties. Okay. And so things like pressure, density, and velocity. Okay. Um, and we have that sharp change just because the fluid doesn't really have time to react to it. Okay. All right. So the question in the chat is that does the stagnation point play a role in this? 
Um, so yes, actually, that's that's a great question. So when, when you have you know compressibility effects, that's going to affect you know your stagnation points and you know how they behave and what effect that they have on your on your um, you know on your on your solid objects. So you know that's that's a that's a story for uh, another day. Um, uh, mostly because I I'm, I'm uh, I will admit that I'm not a, as big an expert on compressible flow to really kind of give a good answer to that. But but the but the answer is yes, it, it will have a big impact on on stagnation. Because normally when you have a flow field like this, you know, things like pressure and density and velocity, you know, they have very smooth, you know, distribution. So, you know, they, they change, obviously, but, you know, the change is very kind of gradual and smooth, you know. Um, but when you have, you know, um, a shock like this. Did he cut off? Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he's frozen for me. Oh, no. Oh, there he goes. Okay. There you're back. Oh, there. Okay. That was weird. Okay. Uh, so, so what I was saying was normally, you know, in a fluid, you know, you have very smooth distributions for these fluid properties like velocity and density and pressure, right? Uh, but once you start to approach, you know, the speed of sound, in order for, you know, everything to be satisfied, you have kind of a sudden chunk, right? So the pressure might look something like this, and then all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's something like that. And so when you have kind of a sharp change in such a small area, you know, that's a shock, and that's, that's basically born just from compressibility effects. All right. Any final questions on on this? I know I know we didn't get too far into it, but if you if you're more interested, you know the less the rest of the lecture notes are there. Um, but the uh, but are there just anything I can answer before we uh, we close shop for today? Can you uh, offset any kind of of the adverse uh, like I obviously like friction and the compressibility can cause um, certain speeds to you know flow over an object in a different way and cause potential slowdowns because of the friction of say air moving over an airfoil. But if you were to create a turbulent boundary layer on your object, like artificially, would that allow for an easier move through a flow that gets compressed like that? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. I, um, there's definitely, you know, a lot of things you can do with the kind of the geometrical design and, and kind of like tripping turbulence, you know, to achieve those kinds of things that you can do um, to kind of minimize these effects or, or, or sometimes you, you want them to, like sometimes you want to maximize certain things too. Um, actually, you know, one thing I didn't get to go over today was the design of a converging diverging nozzle, which, which kind of leverages this to, 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 you know, make a really effective, you know, rocket nozzle. Um, so there's, you know, that's, that's where all the difficulty lies in, in aerospace engineering is, des is designing these geometries and, and kind of manipulating the flow field to kind of get the behavior that you want. Um, I will say that I, I'm, I'm definitely not enough of an expert to really give a, a, a comment kind of beyond that. Um, so I think, uh, it, um, you know, uh, I think probably the ones that would probably know would be like uh, Dr. Myral. Uh, so he's, he's a really big expert on these things. So I think he could give a better answer. But, you know, that's, that's, I know, you know, that's that a lot, that's what a lot of aerospace engineering is, is kind of manipulating the flow in order to get kind of the, the shocks and the, um, you know, boundary layers and stuff, you know, getting all of that, that you, that kind of maximizes your performance. Uh, any, uh, any other questions on, on this stuff? Okay. Oh, uh, professor, I do have a question. Oh yeah, sure. What's up? So we, we still have one more class. You're going to do the review session live on. Yes. On zoom. Yes. Yeah. So I, I'm going to put a poll out. I, I need to, I need to double check uh three B on the homework just to make sure I got the right fifth coefficient. Uh, and then, and then after that, I'm going to put a poll on canvas that I'll, I'll send it, I'll send it out in an email uh, where you can vote on the topics that you want to see. And then we'll spend just all day Thursday, just reviewing them. So, I'll give kind of, you know, it'll be kind of the same format as my recorded review sessions where I'll spend a little bit of time reviewing the concepts uh, and then maybe we'll do like an example problem or two um, on those things, um, you know, and then um, the, the benefit of being live is that you guys can kind of ask questions too and, you know, I'll, I'll make sure to leave time for that um, just to kind of answer just any kind of questions that you have on, on, the, on the material. Okay. Right. Uh, you said Thursday, but you meant Wednesday, right? Yeah, yeah, Wednesday. Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you. 
Uh, could you also double check uh, 3C? I was working backwards on that one just to see if I can get an idea. And I don't know, my math could be wrong, but I ended up um, getting a uh, friction number that was way beyond the chart. Okay. So you mean 2C, right? Uh, yeah, 2C. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll double check both of that. So I'll, I'll double check 2C and 3B. Uh, and then I'll, I'll correct those if, if I need to. And then, I'll, um, and then I'll send out the poll kind of by, by lunchtime today. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Um, so thank you, everybody, for tuning in. If you have any more questions, I'll stick around for a little bit. But I do have office hours after this, too, so you can come by there. Um, so I'll see everyone on Wednesday. Appreciate it, Dr. Tran. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, guys.